Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the surprising role that livestock such as horses or mules or camels can play in falconry. But before we do, if you haven't already, if you could please hit subscribe, it really does help me out. And uh, with that, let's jump on right in. Uh, falconry, of course, as you all know, has been around for thousands of years. And as such, of course, uh, predates modern vehicles. And I think there's a, when we look back at some of the tapestries that we see, uh, for me at least, you know, going through the old falconry books in the old days, you know, and you'd see all these tapestries and illustrations, especially from medieval times into the Renaissance, and you'd see these falconers out in the field and lords and ladies riding on horseback and, oh, they're holding their falcon or their hawk or a knight, you know, with a goshawk as they go off to war on horseback. Uh, it's all a very kind of romanticized view. Uh, or same thing if you if you look through some of the texts and the concept of, uh, you know, the Middle Eastern falconers on, on camelback, uh, you know, out in the beautiful desert with sacred falcons hunting habara bustards. And it's, it's something that makes sense. And we just tend to dismiss it, I believe, as transportation. They didn't have vehicles. We have vehicles now, and that's that. Now, uh, I live in the United States in a in a not so rural area. I have uh, I use a truck. That's what most falconers here locally do, and that's how we haul our birds out to the field. And again, that idea is just this is a point A to point B. That is its point. You know, I live in the city, load up my birds, head out to the desert head to a duck pond, head to sage grouse, you know, where am I going to find the rabbits, the pheasants, the sage grouse, the ducks, that's where I go, I get out of my truck, get out of my bird, and I go hunting, but that is not the sole purpose of, of using livestock. Now, one of the perhaps uh, most iconic forms of livestock still used today in falconry would be in Mongolia, where the eagle trainers there are of course, using uh, strong, stout, cold weather uh, horses that they can use. And they it's hard to picture a Mongolian eagle trainer without a horse as part of the equation. It's all it all seems to be, you know, one entity, eagle, falconer, and horse going out on the steps of Mongolia. Now, of course, part of this is transportation especially because there's no roads, even if they had a vehicle, but you're getting into the hunting territory, and it might be miles and miles and miles into just open, desolate territory. So hauling an eagle that far on foot, where your prey base, the density of prey hunted by eagles in Mongolia is very sparse. So you're having to cover a lot of territory. Doing so by horseback, since you have such a heavy bird, makes a lot of sense. Uh, also, then you can get easily, okay, uh, falcon or horse and eagle all go up to the top of a mountain or a large hill where you have a good vantage point and then, okay, what are you hunting? You know, they're typically hunting rabbits, foxes, and wolves. All of those are large prey. And so giving that height advantage to an eagle that's just being flown off the fist instead of, you know, from uh, from a pitch, from soaring above you, that is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, if you're hunting prey up to as dangerous and as large as a wolf, there's an advantage for you to charge downhill on your horse to get on time to your eagle to help it dispatch the prey so that it's, it has a safe conclusion to that hunt. So all of that makes sense to us in our head. And then you, as a falconer in a different region of the world, might be like, eh, I'm just walking out my door into the forest. Or, hey, I'm taking a truck from the city out to where I'm going to go. That's my version of a horse. But you're forgetting something. You're forgetting some principles that that really make hunting from horse or camel or mule so much better than people realize. And so the first of those has to do with the psychology and the sound. Most parts of the world where there is hunting of any kind, like I'll take my area, jackrabbits. Jackrabbits are, are uh, if you're not from the United States or Canada, a jackrabbit is a type of hare. I know they're not a true rabbit, but they're giant, they're huge, you know. 7 to 14 pound uh, hares and they're uh, they're very smart 
And what happens is when you're way out into the sage country, they are masters of this territory, of this biome. And they know that humans hunt them with guns quite often. And so the sound of a vehicle, the sound of human voices, but especially approaching human footsteps, that's danger. Either run away or stay put, hide by a bush, and do not move until the humans have passed. That is the mentality of these incredibly intelligent rabbits. And so you might have an area that does have a decent density and a decent population of rabbits to hunt, and you're not able to hunt them because you're just walking around. Well, horses and mules and camels, I haven't hunted from camelback, but I haven't had a few opportunities. I don't have a horse of my own, but I have had the opportunity to hunt from horseback a few times with friends, uh, with goshawks, Harris hawks, and Cooper's hawks, and mostly going after rabbits. And here's what I found out. That clop, clop, that quadrupedic gait of a horse in the ear and mind of a jackrabbit registers as, oh, that's a herbivore. Maybe it's a horse, maybe it's a cow, maybe it's a deer or a buffalo, you know, you know, that's what their brain is saying. And so they're, they're not all in alarm mode. And so you are able to approach them much closer. So that's the first thing. And that seems to be across the board. A lot of prey, you know, same thing with ducks, you know, that clop, 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 clop. That is not something that triggers alarm. The quadrupedic gait of a herbivore, of a grazing herbivore, is not something to cause alarm. Especially if they were, if the sound of a bunch of herbivores stampeding, that could mean, oh, a predator's chasing them, I better be on alarm too. But the relaxed walk of a horse is specifically saying, I don't have to be alarmed. I may not be able to see that herbivore at the moment, but the fact of the matter is, it is bigger than me, it has a greater view than me, and it is walking in a way that is not alarmed or agitated or fearful. So, oh, okay, so I don't have to be that fearful. So it's a great advantage with hunting multiple types of prey, just that, just because it's almost like you're in stealth mode. If they can't see you, and they can hear you, and you're on horseback, Stealth mode. It's amazing. The second thing, of course, is height. Horses, camels, mules are very large animals, and it puts you way above the ground, which puts the bird way above the ground. It's a mobile perch, and so they can see over the sagebrush. If a rabbit flushes, if, if, if a hawk is on your fist and a jackrabbit flushes, um, if you're higher, the higher you are, the earlier the bird sees the flush the greater advantage that that bird has to catch up and be able to tackle that prey. Now we, without hunting from horseback, camelback, or mule, we often try to replicate that same concept with tea perches. And it's becoming more and more popular, especially with Harris hawks. People will have a big old tea perch on a pole and they'll walk around and let the hawks perch up there. So it's the same idea, but you still have your footstep, the sound of a bipedal hunter that is still <laughs> gonna cause those rabbits or ducks or pheasants to flush much earlier. But you do have a height advantage so they can see that earlier flush earlier on. But the ideal situation, again, is if you do it from horseback, you get the best of both worlds. You get stealth mode and height advantage. And it's a lot of fun. It is so much fun. Uh, I hope that someday I will live in an area where that is a practical approach for me, that I can have my own horse and hunt from horseback every day. Um, until then, I would say I recommend to all of you, if you ever have the chance to practice the art of falconry from horse, mule, or camel, I highly recommend it because it's amazing, it's intuitive, it's natural, and it's a way to connect more to that circle that modern society pulls us out of and to see uh, multiple species of animal working together for the same cause is uh, a truly brilliant and amazing thing. So. If you have the chance, jump on it just to experience it because it's wonderful. So I hope this insight is uh, moderately entertaining and interesting to you. If you have had experiences with this and would like to share, please in the comments down below, let us know what you have experienced hunting from horseback, camelback, hunting from a mule, and, uh, and how it was for you and uh, uh, what's the pros and cons of it in your area. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And as always, happy hawking.